Second time is a charm. Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. Today is Thursday. Oh, no, it's not. It's Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. It just feels like Thursday. Tuesday, November the 9th. Uh, the health and safety of our community and our staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency, some board rules have been temporarily altered. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking and when you're presenting, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. For those appearing in person, please wear your face covering while you are in the building. And if you're presenting, please state your name before responding to questions for those who are listening remotely. We have public testimony this morning. Um, yes, Madam Chair, we can go. Opportunity for public comment. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you uh, or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. When you are done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Madam Chair, we received two submissions for public testimony and one written testimony, which has been shared with board members and staff. Our first testimony is from Les Wardenar, um, but I do not see that he is in attendance. Um, so next is Matt Perkins, and they are also not in attendance. So I will move on to R1. All right. R1, budget modification number non D 003 22, increasing the business income tax by 30,401,964,000 to support a mid year rebalance to make FY 2022 emergency investments. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Myron seconds approval of R1. <clears throat> Over the last 20 months, Multnomah County has worked tirelessly to lead our community's response to keep each other safe and healthy amid a growing and global public health emergency while simultaneously meeting the needs of our neighbors when their lives and livelihoods were destabilized. COVID-19 quickly found its way into the cracks of nearly all of our systems, suddenly widening the inequities we've worked for decades to narrow and creating a litany of new challenges as well. And still throughout each and every crisis along the way, Multnomah County doubled down on making our community more equitable and meet those challenges head on. As the social safety net, as the main provider of shelter and homeless services, as a leader in public safety interventions and policy, as the local public health authority, the county showed up for our community with the aid of historic investments and expansions of strategies many of which we've co-created with communities that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. And the enormous effort that county staff have made over the course of almost two years has undoubtedly saved lives and stabilized households across the county. But this pandemic, as you know, has been so disruptive, so pervasive and far reaching that community members continue to experience immense and urgent hardships. I think it's safe to say that each one of us on the board agrees that we are facing a crisis point. And in the face of such an emergency, Multnomah County must do more and we must do it now. And with our unexpected $30 million BIT surplus, we can. A surplus that comes at this size is rare. A surplus that arrives at such a critical trying time in our community story is even more rare. And with the help of staff who have dedicated their careers to serving our community, we readily identified multiple areas where a surge of funding could help us to meaningfully improve the lives of the people who have been disproportionately harmed by this pandemic. This funding represents an extraordinary and immediate opportunity to respond to our most pressing challenges through a variety of mid-year investments. Investments that expedite some existing efforts, expand area of of work that we're already doing or add new strategies to meet needs that have recently emerged. 
We understand how singular and significant this moment is as we worked with our partners at the city of Portland to develop a package of programs that can quickly transform the majority of our surplus funding into on the ground services for our neighbors surviving outside. To that end, the county's homeless services investments have been designed to meet the most acute and urgent needs of people surviving outside through programs that can reach them as soon as possible. Likewise, the proposed investments in gun violence intervention and justice system transformation are responses to urgent, pervasive, and inequitable forms of harm that simply cannot wait to be remedied. The department leaders who helped develop these proposals are the same leaders who, along with their teams, have consistently and constantly shown up and stepped up throughout the many crises of the last two years. They've offered their experiences, expertise, and guidance on how to wisely and effectively allocate our resources through two rounds of federal pandemic stimulus funding and two county budgets. And I am grateful for our work together over the last several weeks to find the best use of these new dollars. While doing more now is necessary, the gravity and scale of our challenges requires doing it right. So we have taken care to ensure that these emergency investments are a careful balance of urgency, thoughtfulness, and partnership. It's what our community deserves, and it's what we demand of ourselves. I believe you'll see that reflected clearly in the details that our presenters will share today. We will also provide an update to the board on the implementation of these investments in three months, and then again in six months. The BIT rebalance investments consist of five distinct budget modifications. We'll have an opportunity for commissioner comments and questions after each presentation, and we'll hold a vote after each item. And with that, I'll hand it off to budget director, Christian Elkin, to give us a little more detail on what we'll be voting on today and to set the table for the rest of the meeting. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, chair. If we could start our presentation, um, chair and commissioners, I'm Christian Elkin, the budget director. I use she, her pronouns. It's so lovely to be here in person with y'all today. It's like, very exciting. Uh, as the chair mentioned, today's session includes five voting items appropriating both the countywide revenues and the emergency expenditures in multiple departments to continue to respond to the pandemic related and urgent needs in our community. Most of the items you are reviewing today were discussed last week during the board work session, which was held on Tuesday, November 2nd, and we will identify where the new investments or new proposals have come forward. First, we will review the non departmental investments. If we go to the next slide, Tasia, my apologies. We'll run through the agenda. So, first, we'll review R1, which is non departmental investments, including the countywide frontline worker pay, the community capital fund expansion. And we will receive an update on the child care facility support proposal from preschool for all uh, for note. This is a non voting item. Just an update. Then we will review the city county investments, including both the joint office of homeless services, public health and behavioral health. Uh, next, the joint office will discuss a new investment to expand the alternative shelter program. And then finally, the sheriff and the local public safety coordinating council director will review their proposals for addressing gun violence and Multnomah County's transforming justice initiative. If we could go to the next slide, please. As a quick reminder, as the chair mentioned, we're grounding the 30.4 million dollars of emergency investments in these following guiding principles. First, we want to make sure that we are responding to the most urgent needs in our community specifically those that have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also wanna center our investments on the county's role as the safety net government and as the local public and mental health authority. We wanna ensure that we're continuing to make smart use of our one-time only funding and balancing the immediate needs and the ongoing service needs. And finally, recognizing the opportunity to co-invest with the city of Portland to increase the impact and coordination for homeless services. We could go to our next slide, please. So our first voting item is the non non departmental bud mod. We're asking the board to approve. 30.4 million of 1 time only business income tax revenue. This revenue was collected above our forecasted amount for fiscal year 2021. Due to the extension of the tax filing deadline, a significant portion of these collections were received after the fiscal year 2022 budget was adopted. 
We also have 9.3 million dollars in a countywide set aside for our frontline worker hazard pay, which our chief operating officer will come up in a moment and speak to you about. And finally, there's a new proposal to increase the community capital expansion fund by $600,000, which we will discuss in a moment. So at this time, I would like to invite our chief operating officer, Serena Cruz, who will provide an update on the frontline worker pay. Okay, good morning. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. I'm Serena Cruz. I'm your Chief Operating Officer and really thrilled both to be in front of you today to see your see you in person in this amazing boardroom and also to share with you the great news that we've reached tentative agreements with all of our unions in support of the frontline worker pay. And this gives us the opportunity, the chair's leadership and all of you to Acknowledge those folks who came in during the, the peak of the pandemic and put their lives at risk so that you could serve the community um, and provide those critical pieces of service, whether that was delivering care for folks who had COVID or it was um, ensuring that the tax uh, tax folks were available to be able to to work through those challenges and systems that affected them. So the critical county services uh, remain uh, here because of those folks and we're really pleased to be moving forward and the unions will be voting uh, this week, so. Good news. Thank you. Uh, if we can go to our next slide, please, Tasia. Um, also with me is Kimberly Melton, the chief of staff, who's going to discuss the community capital fund expansion, where we're proposing to add $600,000 to the existing investment of 1.5 million. Good morning, uh, chair and commissioners. My name is Kim Melton. I use she, her pronouns, and I am excited to be with you today to talk about the proposed expansion of the community capital uh, fund. Uh, even before the pandemic, uh, nonprofit organizations in our community have really expressed the need to improve or expand their physical spaces that they use to provide services. And I think as a county, we understand that those critical services they provide on our behalf are important to both the growth and the resilience and health of our community. So in the fiscal year 2022 budget, uh, we actually allotted a $1.5 million in a first ever community capital fund to support land acquisition and capital infrastructure projects. And we opened, um, we focused that need on populations um, that have been particularly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We actually opened um, that, that um, notice of funding availability uh, on October 22nd and intended to have it close initially on November 8th. As we have engaged in more conversation about the need in our community, we have um, proposed to make three important changes to this no for this community capital fund that we have right now. Uh, next slide, please. And so with the additional um, investments of $600,000 into the community capital fund expansion, we'll be able to accomplish three additional goals. We'll be able to increase the fund so that we can serve more community partners, and that will allow us to just have a greater reach in our community at a time when we know that there is increased need and that the cost of, um, associated with real estate and with uh, capital uh, purchases continues to increase. We're also going to broaden the scope um, of this uh, investment, and it will include now property acquisition as well as capital equipment purchase in addition to capital projects that are already underway or that might be shovel ready. And we also are extending the timeline so that our community partners um, who've been reaching out to us and sharing the needs with us can act now and still have an opportunity over the next few weeks to apply and be considered for an investment. And so now that timeline will be extended to November 22nd um, for um, interested parties to be able to apply. And those changes and shifts in the, the scope and the timeline, we have already made those and begun to communicate those out. And then pending um, the decision and approval by the board today, we'll be able to also serve additional partners with this investment. And one other note I would make is that this um, investment will be both uh, focused on larger organizations as well as we're going to have um, a specific um, set aside that we'll be able to invest with smaller organizations as well so that we can have a greater reach 
because we know that there are large organizations doing big things that we want to support. And we know there are also smaller organizations that are just in their infancy and need an, a, an appropriate and timely investment that would make a difference in who they're able to serve. And with that, I am happy to take any questions that you have about that. Or wait until later, whatever <laughs> you would like to do, Chair. We finished with um, our one presentation. We have one more non-voting item. It's the uh, preschool for all child care facility support proposal, okay. and then we'll be ready to vote on, on non-D Perfect. Item let's, one. let's hear from Leslie, and then we will have questions, comments from the board. And we, vote. we go to the next slide, Tasia. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to your first in-person board meeting. <laughs> Good morning, chair and commissioners. Uh, my name is Leslie Barnes and I'm the preschool and early learning division di director and I use she, her pronouns. I'm here today to share details about a non-voting proposal included in this emergency investment package. Uh, we are proposing to spend $100,000 from the Preschool for All Fund to support the development and improvement of new and existing child care facilities. The lack of early learning spaces in our community remains a significant barrier to Preschool for All's work. The real estate market, as you know, is incredibly competitive and expensive. That combined with the very specific needs of child care providers makes development of new facilities extremely difficult. In addition, providers must navigate multiple layers of regulation from numerous agencies in order to move forward with infrastructure projects. These challenges are magnified for our black, indigenous, and providers of color and providers who speak diverse languages. Why this investment now? Um, we included funding for the child care infrastructure in our FY22 budget, and we continue to work toward a preschool for all facilities fund. Tax bills for preschool for all are not due until April 15th of 2022, and the preschool and early learning division is still primarily operating off of a line of credit that you approved last year. That line of credit cannot be used for infrastructure projects. We need to wait until tax collection increases before we are more or before we are able to create the preschool for all facilities fund. Um, but we do anticipate having enough revenue to make the smaller investment that we're proposing today. This $100,000 allows us to start laying the groundwork for future preschool for all investments and leverages $350,000 in outside dollars, $100,000 from the city of Portland and $250,000 of private sector investments. These combined funds will go to the Prosper Portland with two main purposes. To create a child care navigator position within the city of Portland who can help child care providers work through requirements for multiple bureaus to keep their projects moving forward. And it will also distribute small grants for child care providers across Multnomah County to expand and improve their facilities. We'll be working closely with Prosper Portland and other system partners to ensure that these grants are distributed in a process that aligns with our racial equity goals. This small investment on our part will help create a foundation for our future child care preschool facilities infrastructure work and support providers who are ready to expand and improve their spaces in the near term. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have uh, time for questions. Actually, first of all, did we receive any public testimony in this item? Tasia? No, Madam Chair, we did not. Um, commissioners, we have questions. You can ask questions of any of our presenters here on R1. And um, wow, do I still start with going in order? I feel like I'm kind of <laughs> into that right now. So I guess we're gonna do it again. Commissioner Stegman, you're up. Thank you, Chair. It's great to see everyone in, in real life. Uh, thank you, Leslie. I, I had a question. Uh, so you said that Prosper Portland is going to be administering this fund. Will those funds be reaching East County as well? Yes. Yeah, so um, the Prosper Portland is going to be a holding, uh, right, for the fund. And a third party community partner, we're actually distributing so they can be used countywide and not just within the city of Portland limits. Great. Uh, I don't have other questions, but thank you so much for being here. Sure, Vicki Peterson. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone, um, for this. Um, I just wanted to say it's. Uh, I'm really glad um, to hear, um, Serena, your update around the status of the um, of the frontline worker hazard pay. And I know that there was a lot of work that went into um, to get this to to this place where we could have these tentative um, agreements. So, just good work to you and, and the whole team. And then um, I'm also really excited about the childcare facilities and the partnership we have with this. I think that. Um, 
this is actually this work is going to help us um, to to drive both quality and capacity as we're looking at the investments that we'll be making in and out years with preschool for all and when we have um, a real solid um, facilities plan. We know that the need is, is a huge one, and this is going to, I think, get us in a good plan as well as provide immediate assistance to people who are struggling right now to get through the system. So just really happy about all these um, investments. Thank you. Mr. Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. It's great to see you all in person. I wasn't here last week, so I missed the last time we did this, um, and it's good to be back. Um, uh, I just one quick question for him, I hate to make you walk all the way up again for a quick question, but. Um, I was wondering, Kim, how, you know, I know that we originally were going to close it yesterday. So I was just curious as to how many the volume of applications that we've received. The, I, um, for the record, Kim Melton, she, her pronouns. And as of last week, I haven't gotten the most recent update. We had about 11. Um, applications um, as of about middle of the week last week, and, and the volume, the dollar. I do not know the vol the um, the the requested amount of funds, um, but I can find that out. And share that. Thank you. I, I just want to appreciate all of these items. Um, uh, COO Cruz, congratulations. I you know I can imagine that that was a heavy lift, and it's so important that we recognize those workers. I'm really really excited that we're able to do that. Um, I really appreciate the, the community capital fund, as you said, Kim, you know, this, this to, to me, this is essential infrastructure for the organizations that provide our services. It's like the infrastructure that we need in our capital um, facilities as well. And so it's exciting to be able to add to that. And it's exciting to be able to fund smaller organizations as well as larger ones. So really appreciate that. Um, and we've heard loud and clear from the preschool community that this is necessary. So. I know we're not voting on it, but I'm I'm glad that we're able to hear about it and that we're able to do that as well. Thanks, everyone. Mr. Myron. Thank you. Um, I want to add my appreciation for all of the work that has gone into this, for all of you for being here today to share this with us and with the public. And um, I echo some of the comments that my fellow commissioners have already made. Uh, particularly about the um, the uh, facilities, the infrastructure investment. I think that that is really exciting and many of our uh, partner organizations and others in the community uh, will have opportunities they've never had before and that is huge. So that is great. I also appreciate um, the child care uh, support and uh, I know that's not a voting item either, but, um, you know, it is such a big issue. I anticipate that we will be uh, hearing a lot about that and working on things to broaden that scope and invest in during our, our regular budget process. So thank you so much. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jarapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Bukerson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. R2A, budget modification number JOHS 005 22, appropriating $33,795,868 in the Joint Office of Homeless Services for mid-year emergency investments in emergency shelter and expanding homeless services. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R2. Uh, we have Mark Jolin from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. The second package, R2, has two items to it. It's 2A two, two and 2B, but combined, they represent the entirety of the uh, investments that were co-investing with the City of Portland. So we wanted to make sure that they came to you as, as one um, specific item to review. So, Mark, take it away. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. For the record, Mark Jolin. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the Director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services for Multnomah County and the City of Portland. It is 
genuinely good to be back here with all of you um, and to see you. I had the opportunity to walk you through um, the sort of specifics of the packages last week. So I'm going to be relatively brief, um, focus a little bit more today on, on process and timeline with some of the packages. I know that there have been questions about that and some of the goals for the investments and then um, uh, obviously time for questions. So maybe the next slide. So as we talked about last week, um, there are essentially four elements on the services side of this investment proposal. Um, first is around outreach and navigation, and the focus is on expanding pretty significantly by about 20 FTE. The number of outreach workers that are doing navigation to people who are in encampments in our community, helping um, them with their basic needs, helping assess them for services, helping them navigate to shelter and other resources in the community. We've already, as part of this year's budget, um, invested in expanding our navigation team that currently goes to higher impact encampments um, that are subject to being posted by the city's impact reduction program. Um, by virtue of that, we're actively engaged with our outreach providers um, in, in the expansion of navigation outreach services. So we're optimistic that uh, if this budget package is approved, we'll be able to move relatively quickly with those providers to continue the expansion. Um, it will be an opportunity to reach out to other providers as well, of course, to see about their interest in participating in this program. Um, but I do think in terms of process and planning, it's underway, and I think we'll be able to move pretty quickly towards um, staffing up this particular item. I will say, as you know, uh, our providers are struggling uh, with, with staffing, so I can't commit to a certain date, cert but I do know that there's interest and, and that folks are already in that process of, of looking for people in the community who want to do this work. Um, in terms of the goals on this package, to increase connections to shelter and other services for people who are in the focused areas of this navigation work, to decrease unsanctioned camping in those areas, and to resolve existing and emerging conflicts between unsheltered and other residents without the need for police or other higher forms of uh, intervention. The second package of investments is around expansion of hygiene and storage. Again, we talked about this um, last time, but it starts with a, an assessment of both the gaps and some of the opportunities that might exist, both on the hygiene side and the storage side, doing that quickly uh, in partnership with, with a third party that can lead that work um, for both the city and the county, um, but also working immediately to identify what we know is already working, what we know is already a possibility in the short term, um, in terms of timeline and process, the joint office, again, in this budget year, has initiated some new contracts um, for hygiene services in the community, some new partnerships that we can leverage. Um, and the city also, in its COVID response, has built out a, a sort of series of hygiene-related um, programs that they can also build even as we go forward with, with the planning effort that's envisioned here. So the project goals with respect to the hygiene, um, are to provide bathrooms, showers, laundry, and trash services to people living unsheltered to improve their health and to reduce community impacts from unsheltered homelessness, to provide expanded points of entry into shelter and other services by utilizing hygiene sites as an engagement opportunity, and to facilitate increased participation in shelter and other services by addressing the need of people experiencing homelessness to have safe property storage options as they participate in those services. The third item is the Street Services Coordination Center. Uh, because this Center will be housed at the city of Portland. The process and timeline will depend significantly on the partnership with the city. But I understand uh, that the folks who are um, supporting this effort on the city side see this as a high priority. And of course, the joint office will do everything we can to move the center forward as quickly as possible. Because we've already been facilitating ongoing coordination efforts among many of the same entities that will be part of that center. Um, we know that we have a strong foundation to build on and can move quickly. We're also not waiting for the center to be established before building out the components that we're responsible for, including hiring someone to lead the coordination work in the joint office, implementing the coordinated shelter bed allocation process, and building out the additional coordinated navigation outreach capacity. So here the program goals are to improve coordination and real-time resource prioritization among city public space management bureaus, and the homeless response system through the joint office to implement a system of centrally administered outreach and shelter allocation to connect people with services in locations and areas that are prioritized through this new center 
and to increase access to shelter and services for individuals who are in routine contact with public space management agencies. Finally, the fourth component of this package is workforce recruitment and retention. The process and timeline here is we're developing an implementa implementation strategy now through our program team, and we'll be ready to make the necessary contract amendments as soon as this package is approved. The goals, of course, here are to increase the pool of qualified applicants for critical frontline positions, including outreach, shelter, and housing case management, and to increase the rate at which vacant positions can be filled, and also to increase the retention of critical frontline employees, including those same outreach workers, shelter workers, housing case managers, by improving their compensation levels. Next slide, please. So the next package of investments is around emergency shelter expansion. Because we're always evaluating opportunities for potential shelter expansion, we will be able to move quickly to deploy these resources. That said, every real estate transaction depends on the success of the negotiations with the other party and when we intend to purchase. Rather than just lease, there's also a necessary due diligence process that we have to go through. So we can't put a date certain on these projects, but based on where we are, I have a high level of confidence that we will see additional shelter capacity come online over the next several months. There are questions, and you can see here, um, with respect to the mix of shelter types. Um, of the 400 or so beds of ongoing capacity that we're projecting here, about half our motel, half our congregate, and there are also spaces for alternative shelter or safe rest style villages that could be as large as 60 sleeping pods. Our goals with these investments are to expand the number of shelter beds in the long term publicly funded shelter inventory by at least 400 beds. To continue to diversify the range of range of shelter types and geographic distribution of shelter options in our community. And to prioritize both short term capacity expansion and the acquisition of properties that offer longer term redevelopment potential as permanent supportive housing, affordable housing or other safety net programming. Going to the next item as well. We're going. Um, if the board uh, would like, we can go to the behavioral health and public health investments, and then we can return to the two voting items, or we can stop here for questions. Yeah, we'll stop here because um, I know that we have some uh, public comment on this piece as well. So, um, Tasha, did we receive any public testimony on this item? Um, yes, Madam Chair, we have two people signed up. Uh, when it's your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you. Um, I will set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. When you're done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Uh, Les Wardenar, you... Yeah. It won't let me unmute you. Hello. There you are. We can hear you. Hello. Okay. Is Matt Perkins on the line? We had hoped that he could, uh, we could reverse and he could testify first. Otherwise, I can go ahead. Is he available there? Um. Yes. One. Matt, are you on the line? Yes. <clears throat> Okay. If you'd let him go first, then I can follow quickly after. Okay. All right. Hello. My name is Matt Perkins. Uh, I'm with Shelter Now, and uh, I also am an employee of uh, Greater Good Northwest. I, I've got some good experience as part of being hospitals uh, recently. And I'm just basically calling the really important uh, non second. Yes. I don't know if it's maybe that you're too close to your microphone you're it's very uh, garbled when you speak so maybe oh, uh, is this better yes okay uh yes uh well my name is Matt Perkins uh I'm a children now and uh I work at Greater Good Northwest I have several years of recent lived experience on the streets and it, I'm basically calling this the importance of non-traditional shelter. Uh, the congregate model is basically designed to keep people alive, but not to get them out of the system. Non-traditional models like motels and uh, sink movements allow people to uh, lift themselves up and get out of homelessness rather than be in a perpetual level. And uh, that's the 
point that I'm trying to make is that uh, I'm going away from the traditional phone to get possible. possible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Les, you are unmuted and you can start. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Les Wardner. I'm chair of the Interfaith Alliance on Poverty, and I'm also a convener of a co convener of Shelter Now, and it's in that capacity that I'm uh, testifying this morning. Uh, Shelter Now was formed by the Interfaith Alliance on Poverty and the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods, and our uh, board contains people from the faith community, neighborhood associations, service providers, and as you heard from Matt, people with lived experience. We are very excited about the budget proposal overall, and uh, we'll be working with you as much as we possibly can to make it successful. We do have some questions about the net increase in the beds that's mentioned at 400 units. Some of them appear to be winter units only, and we've had experience in the past where units did come on, but others came off. So we're looking to see if that's a 400 net increase for an entire year. That's the concern we have there. With respect to <clears throat> alternative shelters, we certainly support the motels. We support congregate shelters, but as Matt indicated, uh, we've had people with lots of bad experiences and people who want to avoid those kind of uh, shelters. So we are strong advocates of alternative shelters, especially tiny uh, village, home villages. Uh, for example, the Afro-American Village and the CPO3 LBGTQ um, villages that are now in place appear to be highly successful. So we would urge the county and the joint office to do as much as you possibly can to direct investments into uh, into those areas. We obviously support hygiene and storage. Um, we're suggesting that you might want to take a look at a program called Urban Rest Stop, which is a, um, in effect in Seattle and appears to have been fairly quite successful, especially in the area of hygiene. With respect to outreach and navigation, uh, we're not entirely clear what that is. We are strongly uh, worried about the overuse of sweeps. We know the city is responsible for sweeps, but we would ask the county to do well, what it can to minimize the need for sweeps and when they do occur to use uh, trauma-informed care as much as possible with respect to the, uh, the houseless community. Finally, I just want to say that uh, we believe the success or failure of this budget proposal, a lot of it is going to depend not on how much money, but on the actual implementation. And so we would urge as much creativity as possible from the county and from the joint office. Uh, we used to have an expression when I was in zero that if you always if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And we believe that we need some um, more than that if, at this particular time in Portland's history. So we urge both innovation and creativity, but also a more aggressive working with the community who's already engaged in these kind of activities. We consistently. I'm sorry, your, your time. The, the okay. buzzer. Well, Thank you very much, and we will always, uh, you can count on support from Shelter Now, whatever, however we can help. Thank you. Appreciate uh, both of you testifying this morning. Thank you. All right, commissioners, um, we're going to start this time for, for questions and comments with uh, Commissioner Myron. Um, so, I, I just have a question about process and and so this is where we would make just our general comments on this particular slate or yes on r2a which does not include r2b is the um is behavioral health and public health r3 is the five hundred thousand for emergency shelter rfpq and r4 is the um emergency gun violence investments and then r5 is the uh, lipstick transforming justice. So this piece right here is just um, the part that you have on your screen that Mark has just spoken to. So um, 
This has been uh, an interesting budget process. Uh, many people have been working 24 seven to put together a package that um, I think we all hope will address some of the biggest crises facing our city and our county. And I want to, first of all, express my gratitude to all of you here, um, particularly um, for the time and energy of Chair Kafori and for Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Ryan, Mark, um, everyone's staff, and especially Kim Melton, who herded the cats and did so much work connecting the dots to put together a plan um, and with so much money in a matter of weeks. Um, that is quite a feat. And many of the recommendations that have been made uh, in this, and then I'll speak to later later um, investment prospects, uh, align with what I've been proposing for a long time. And I am very glad that there's consideration being given to the horrific conditions in which people uh, have been living unsheltered uh, for years on our streets and the impact that this is having not only on individuals themselves, but on our community as a whole. And so I do uh, in particular share the goals uh, of harm reduction, increasing safe and stable places for people to stay, supporting frontline workers um, particularly, and better communication and coordination across agencies. Um, however, I do have to say, I would have liked to have seen us starting with a shared big picture vision in mind and then developing a roadmap to get there with specific timelines, outcomes and assessment points along the way to ensure we're making progress. And I, you know, this is something that comes up frequently, I think in our budget discussions, but I, I don't believe that progress is effectively measured by outputs, um, but by defined goals of what we want to see. And um, you know, the, the reality is that the decisions that we are making here shouldn't be about receiving a windfall of tens of millions of dollars and rushing to spend it in a few weeks so it can sort of look like we're doing something urgently. The reality is that this humanitarian public health and public safety crisis was emergent long before the COVID pandemic. And because we didn't prioritize, invest, and treat it like the emergency it was for so long, we, local government, let it spiral out of control. In this rush process, uh, it feels like we did not gather community input effectively. And I'm not sure if there was a, a major process for gathering community input, but I do know that the city votes on their fall bump tomorrow, and there are at least 200 people signed up to provide public testimony. Uh, and I know their fall bump process includes more than the joint city county homelessness response package, but it demonstrates the community really desires to be included in our budget making decisions. And there's all kinds of information we might be able to glean, which we can't factor into the decisions that we're making today. Um, I feel that to build confidence and trust with the community as well, we need to have oversight and accountability to ensure that this one-time boon, an incredible $60 million between city and county, doesn't get spread so thin or lead to such kind of vague investments in capacity of services and number of teams that we lose sight of the bigger picture, which is we want to pre prevent people from living on the streets and get them the services they need and a better place to be and that we will have little to show for this a year after we vote to um, invest this incredible amount of money we should be able to see with this tremendous investment a visible and huge impact on the humanitarian crisis of unsheltered homelessness we're seeing on the streets and i feel that this slate as it's been presented will dissipate as we spend on an array of services that are not, they, they sound good, they are good, but they don't fit together into a meaningful whole. And, um, and so I, in terms of outreach, I absolutely agree with that. I do outreach personally through Portland Street Medicine. 
And I see what a poorly coordinated outreach system we have with some places redundant, others getting no service. And so it feels somewhat like we're going to be putting additional teams on this, maybe not ideally functional coordinated package of outreach that we already have with tremendous providers doing the work, but not coordinated. Sorry, my mask is falling. Um, and in terms of hygiene and storage, I worry as well that we are, um, you know, during the extreme heat event, I saw people in the ER, I've seen people in street medicine, I've seen people, I know that one of the biggest reasons they don't go for needed services is in fact, um, fear of having their belongings stolen. And I know that one of the biggest reasons for much of the trash and discarding of clothes that we see that I would like to see investments in is because people don't have the facilities for hygiene and clothes washing. This is not only an issue of their own personal dignity and hy hygiene, but a tremendous envir in environmental impact as well. So I support investing in hygiene services for unsheltered individuals, and I see effective models that are out there, such as Hygiene for All, which is brilliant. I would ex be interested in expanding this, but I don't support using some of our BIT revenue to fund an assessment, yet another study that will take months to complete. And when we have the information already, we should have enough information to decide where to make impactful investments. Um, I would like to be included in the planning for deployment of these types of services and development of the urban rest stop concept uh, because those are great ideas but I think we can implement, we don't need to study and delay. Um, and finally, for the services coordination center portion, we desperately need alignment across all of the outreach services we provide to people who are houseless in the city and county. This includes crisis services such as Project Respond and Portland Street Response and many, many others. But without alignment and effective use of the outreach services we have, we'll continue to pour money into outreach with amazing people doing incredibly difficult frontline work without seeing meaningful change. Crisis services need to be aligned and administered through the local mental health authority, I believe, given its statutory authority with partnership from the city and outreach for homeless people should be administered through the joint office and that joint office of homeless services. Um, the coordination center concept that is referenced here is different from what I consider to be coordination. It doesn't sound like it'll get additional people into shelter, that it will streamline the processes so actual real people needing shelter can call in, find out when a bed is available and provide that kind of service. And so I, I, I have trouble investing in something that will only serve would appear to be the, the first responders to get a few people in a few places into shelter. And finally, I, I do support investing one time only in the purchase of facilities for, for short term use that can be repurposed when we, um, when we get to that point. Uh, I am not sure I totally agree with the leasing as part of this package process. And I also worry that there will not be a significant change in how many people are actually living on our streets, that we will see a few hundred beds when we have thousands and thousands of people living outside. I also am concerned about operating costs for all of these, the ongoing costs that we haven't accounted for that I've been told will be part of our fiscal year 23 budget process. And that, that worries me. There's gonna be tens of millions of dollars of ongoing operating costs that we haven't accounted for here. So for all these reasons, um, you know, and there, there are specific things that they were pulled out, I, I would vote for. And I, again, I really support some of the concepts and have in fact have pushed these priorities, but as these are all together and I can't separate them out and I'm not comfortable approving the package as it stands, so I'll be voting no. 
and it's not because I don't believe in urgently addressing our homeless crisis, um, but because I do believe in it. And I feel that the urgency we talk about in rushing to do this is in many ways sort of more of a, a marketing ploy and some words that say we're acting urgently. It's going to be a long time um, before we see anything happen, let alone a whole sort of um, big picture response. So that being said, I realize I will probably be in the minority here. And there are these great concepts that are in there. And as Les mentioned, who called in, um, much will turn not on the amount of money, but on the implementation. So despite my vote of no, I want to assure you that if the budget does pass, I will be fully supportive and do everything I can to ensure these funds are used to achieve the outcomes we all want to see and that there is transparency and accountability in the process. Thank you. Mr. Jayapal. So new to being back here, Laura, I forgot to turn on the mic. Um, and, and thank you, Mark, for the presentation and also for uh, the responses you've given us in the meantime, since the last briefing, you've responded to a number of the questions that I had, so appreciate that. I have a couple of uh, kind of smallish questions, but, um, and then some comments. So one question around uh, speed, right? We're, we're focused on immediacy and we all know that immediate doesn't mean tomorrow. It means months from now for, for lots of reasons. I'm curious about whether there's anything we can do about our processes that helps with that. So contracting processes, hiring processes, under the emergency that extends to December 20th, I, you know, I, I believe that that allows us some leeway that speeds things along. Is there is there anything else? Is there a layering of an additional emergency? That's a COVID emergency. Can we, you know, is is there something else that can be done around our, the speed of our processes? Because that seems to be a continual stumbling block. So oh, I may not be the best person to answer that question. I'm happy to look yeah. at it. So, so much of that is administrative rules and requirements um, that I'm less familiar with, but um, I and know Mark, that, pause, I'm please. Sorry. Kim Milton's coming down. Oh. You don't know the answer? Step aside. Okay. <laughs> I can keep talking. Seems to be my job to keep bringing Kim to the podium. <laughs> Good morning, Kim, Kim Milton, she, her pronouns. In terms of, um, I think there's sort of two ways to think about um, our pathway. One is around sort of internally as an organization, what sort of abilities we have to be creative and move more swiftly. And under our state of emergency that's related to COVID-19, we do have the ability to be um, to use exemptions to um, engage in partnering or contracting with organizations more swiftly. Um, and they do allow us when we're doing it for a set amount of time. And we have been doing a fair amount of that. I forget the number right now of how many um, exemption contracts we've done over the last 18 months, but several. So we'll continue to use that as one rapid way of engaging with partners with whom we don't currently have a contract that might speed along our ability to get money to them to move things forward. So I think that's gonna be an important piece. I think also on the hiring side internally and um, we know that as an organization, we're hiring and at a massive rate and not just the joint office, but across the whole organization where we have sort of critical um, sort of safety net functions. And I know that our HR teams and um, both Travis and Serena have been working with our, our leadership around how we can help support our HR um, systems and, and folks to be able to do recruitment and hiring um, in, in ways that are creative and that can help us prioritize which things we need to move forward first. And um, we do have um, sort of a new um, and growing HR team in the joint office that will be able to hopefully assist us in being able to move quickly and to hire in that way. And then I think for our organizations, our nonprofits, I think one of the pieces that's important to this package is the part around workforce retention, because that I think is going to be one of the single most important things we can do to help support our contractors to more quickly be able to hire up and get people um, moving. We've also been exploring other ways that we might be able to provide sort of other types of technical assistance or supports to the HR teams within our uh, nonprofits that um, where we may be able to help them um, be able to speed along their processes as well. But I think that the hiring one-time bonus and adding that 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 additional um, 
um, investment will also make a big difference in their speed since they're also already hiring right now for um, other investments. So I'd say those are kind of the three things and we will continue to try to move those as quickly um, as we can. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I think the only uh, sort of open question that doesn't have to be answered today that at least for me is that to the extent that the declaration of emergency is helping with some of that expediting, you know, consideration of whether we need to extend that beyond December 20th. Right. Yeah. It felt like yeah, I heard, saw you nod. Yes, so, that's yeah. next on okay. the uh, coming up. Okay. Right. That is coming up and we'll be Good today's action, but soon. Yeah. <laughs> But that's think. great. And, and I, you know, appreciate I, I completely agree on the workforce retention piece. I seem to remember that I heard last that we have 600 open positions across the county at this point in time. Um, and I, I think that's an important number to put out there. That is close to 10% of our total workforce. So the challenge of now ramping up for this additional work is just, just incremental to that. Um, so thank you for, for that. That really helps. Uh, and then another question, I, I think this is for Mark, but maybe you should stay Kim, since I, I keep bringing you back. Um, I, I want to appreciate Les and, and Matt's testimony and to one of the questions that Les asked around congregate shelter versus alternative versus motel and other, other forms of non-congregate shelter, two questions. Um, first, are our congregate shelters at capacity? In other words, this goes to what we hear a lot, which is there are folks who don't want to come into congregate shelter. That's absolutely true. The question is, are there enough people who do want to co come into congregate shelter that it makes sense to add? Um, and then maybe just a little bit about the trade off as you were thinking of the, the, how you think about the trade offs between congregate motel alternative that, you know, that it's not, it's not a blank slate. We can just add all of it. What do we, what do you think about? Thank you, Commissioner. So, um, in terms of the utilization of our congregate shelters, we now have a monthly utilization report. We're at ninety percent routinely of actually people in in the beds. There are always beds being held for folks who have been out for a few days or are coming. So there's always a little bit of flux in that system, um, and sometimes the provider has to hold some beds aside because they're doing repair work or something like that. But we have we have a lot of demand for our congregate shelter. They are full for practical purposes. Um, and as we open new spaces, whether it's new winter shelter or expanded capacity, we always are able to fill those because we do have a lot of people for whom that is it is a better option than being outside. Um, and they, you know, we're very intentional about creating environments that are supportive of the people who are there, staffing them appropriately, having the amenities on site that make it it make folks able to be safely in that environment with a lot of other folks. Um, so I think I would appreciated the comment about the, the challenges some folks face in congregate shelter. The, the one thing I, I want to make clear is our congregate shelters are not intended to have somebody to just become sheltered and stay sheltered, right? The, the goal of our congregate shelters, as with all of our shelter, is to have folks receive the supports they need to be able to successfully move out. So, um, and that's true of all the motel shelters and the village style shelters as well, but really people are coming in to stabilize, to be safe in the moment, yes, and to have their basic needs met, but they're coming there with the expectation that they're going to get the supports they need to move out because it's not a sustainable living situation, right? It's not intended to be even transitional housing. It's intended to be an emergency response to an emergency situation that then is a springboard to, to a better situation for that person. But so those, those shelters are full. Um, as are the other ones, right? Um, in terms of how we think about the, the sort of balance, um, we're, we're taking into consideration a lot of factors. Um, some is uh, has to do with just the number of people we can serve because we have so many people who are outside um, in the amount of space that we have and with the dollars that we have available to us. Um, so the motels are a little bit more expensive to operate. They provide a higher level of individual space, of course. Um, but we can't house as many people or shelter as many people in, in, a, in a motel as we can in a typical congregate environment for the same cost. So that's a, that's important consideration. Um, same with the village model. Um, it, they are smaller, generally speaking. Um, they take up more physical space to create. Their operation costs are similar. So, you know, what we're really looking at is the mix of types of shelter, what the needs are of particular populations in the community when it comes to shelter, what the community is telling us they want, right, as much as we can. Um, but again, never losing sight of the fact that this is all shelter. It's all temporary. It's all intended to be 
a safe space off the streets while folks get connected to the services that they need to get back into housing. So um, there isn't there isn't a magic formula, but we're always looking at cost availability and what the need is that folks are expressing to us in the community as we look at these options. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. And you know, I think the key phrase, there's no magic formula, applies to pretty much all of this. That that there isn't there isn't, first of all, one answer. And there isn't any clear answer as to the balance on the mix of things between whether it's between types of shelter or between short term, long term, immediate, long lasting. It, that there's 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 not a silver bullet. There's not even ten silver bullets. It's it's all um, a question of balancing. So appreciate that. So with I think those were my questions. Just a few uh, a few comments. Um, you know this this is an un, it, unprecedented that that word is so overused. <laughs> It's it's an unprecedented opportunity. We we don't have surpluses like this um, typically, and we don't use our surpluses in the way that we're using them now. We typically uh, carry them over for for future years rather than spending them in a midterm balance. I do believe that on balance, the package that you have here is a good use of these funds. Um, you know, I think. Uh, I, I see what we, what's happening on our streets, what we're seeing in terms of the immediacy of the absolute crisis that's there as being significantly attributable to the cum cumulative and ongoing impacts of COVID and that we had a crisis before and that was exacerbated to an unprecedented degree by, by the pandemic. With that being the case, using some these immediate surpluses to do what we can in terms of some strategies that'll have more immediate impact and I say more immediate because I just I, I want folks to be clear that they're not going to see something change tomorrow or next week or even the week after that that immediate is relative um, but I do believe that these strategies are different from the ongoing strategies that we have in place in a couple of ways one is that there's a focus on particular areas um, that there's a focus on those areas of high impact encampments that are both creating significant additional health and safety risks for unhoused folks and for surrounding communities and for those locations where there is conflict and the, 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 the possibility of conflict. I think that's different. We haven't done, we haven't used our outreach and our navigation teams or any of our other strategies in that way to this extent. And I think that's really different and it will have more immediate impact in those neighborhoods and the things, you know, the outreach navigation teams being focused on those areas, behavioral health outreach, which we haven't talked about yet, but again, we're going to hear that those teams are going to be focused on um, high impact encampments, the shelter bed set aside for folks coming from those environments. Again, that's different. So I think in responding to um, the immediate needs on the grounds of unhoused folks in those situations, as well as the surrounding communities, this is a good way to, to have that immediate impact. The focus on meeting the needs, the hygiene, the trash, the storage, those immediate um, needs of, again, both the people living unhoused and the folks around them, I think is a really smart investment. It's, and it's not something that the county has invested in before. So again, that's something that's new to me in terms of how we're using these funds that we have not invested in those areas. That's been the city primarily. And I think it's appropriate for us to invest some of these funds there as well. Um, I do think that that storage piece also connects to the piece around moving into shelter. And so that's got the added benefit of that as well. Uh, I, the workforce, you know, I, we can't do this without the workforce. We've talked about this a little bit already, and I think that's absolutely critical. Um, we are not going to be able to, it, it, restaurants are having trouble hiring people. We, these, the folks that we need to hire have come with a much higher degree of experience and skill. So folks shouldn't be surprised that it's hard for us to hire and that workforce investment is critical. And then the additional investments in shelter capacity. You know, I, I share some of the concerns that Les voiced about congregate shelter and about continuing to increase our, our uh, inventory of congregate shelter. Uh, I do think it's a balance and I don't have the magic answer for the balance and I, I, I you know, I, I am comfortable with this. But to me, the motel shelter it has always been um, sort of a, an opportunity that I've wanted us to continue to, to invest in. And so I'm really pleased about those investments. I think that the motel shelter is 
is showing to be more effective for people who are housed there in terms of transitioning them into permanent housing. And it's a short term investment that can be converted into something else down the road. So I think that's really wise. And some additional investment in community led alternative shelter. I so appreciate the work that folks like Les and Matt, Shelter Now, so many other community groups are doing to participate in solutions to not just um, sort of call out concern, but to actually participate in solutions. And I think that one of the roles that we as government can play is to support those community organizations. So I appreciate that, that investment. And then finally, coordination with the city. This is this this is an unprecedented again level of coordination with the city in terms of really aligning our investments to theirs, and I think that's a, a really important piece of this package. I have some concerns. Um, I have concerns about the ongoing costs. I I totaled up, and I appreciate the information that um, the chair's office has provided, and you have provided about that. They were estimates. I did a back of the envelope calculation. It's at least looks like at least 15 million in ongoing costs. And perhaps more, there were some that weren't estimated out. That's that's a significant commitment. Um, and at the same time, we are in a place where we do need to do this, some things that have immediate impact. So I, you know, I'm I'm voicing the concern, but um, willing to move forward nevertheless. Uh, the coordination between services, I think, is a concern. We do have a lot of uh, outreach teams and navigation teams out there. And response teams of various kinds. And so I pull in, for example, Portland Street response, very supportive, really exciting that it's being expanded. Um, but when I have conversations about the connections between a Portland Street response and a project respond and the city's behavioral health units, what I'm hearing is that the handoffs aren't there and that there is overlap and that there are still gaps. So I do think there's a need for coordination that and we need to do better at that. Um, and I, I have always, you know, I, I, I've, I've always articulated my belief that part of the balancing here is short-term strategies versus long-term strategies. And in a perfect world of unlimited resources, we would do it all, and that's not the world we live in. Um, I can see, we've already seen the resource it's taken to develop these, these, this package. And it's going to take an enormous amount of additional resource on your part, the joint office, the city, the chair's office, you know, DCHS, to roll out the implementation of this 30 million. And that is going to have to happen on top of the continued focus on moving people into housing, on implementing the supportive housing services measure. So I have some concern about what it's going to take to do this pivot without losing sight of what's ultimately going to solve the problem, because all of these strategies I do believe will have impact and they are not going to solve the long term problem. Um, and so figuring out how to do both of those things is, um, is, a, is a challenge. And I, I know you know that. Um, so with all of that, I, I, you know, are some, there are some concerns. I think we all have them. And always there's a balance between planning and action. Um, uh, I, I think there's some ways in which it feels like we haven't spent enough time on planning, other ways in which it may spend as if we've spent too much time and we need to act. Again, there's not a perfect balance, but when I look at the package as a whole and think about what I believe it can and it can accomplish, um, I am supportive, I'm excited, and uh, I will be voting yes. Thank you. Chair Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thanks so much, um, Mark and Kim and everyone for um, these kinds of investments. I do have a couple of questions and Mark, I'm going to ask them to you, but I, but they, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer them because some of them have to do with the city and it specifically around the street services coordination center and the light alignment with the joint office. So, you know, I think that, um, as commissioner Jayapal was saying about the need for real coordination, this is an aspect of the coordination, right? That's really dealing with the city. Um, I was out, um, with the rig team with Metro, um, and, um, president Peterson on Friday, and we were, um, cleaning up a site that was an unimproved road, right? And there were, um, work that was being done to help remove some of the, the trash that's being dumped by people as well as cars. Um, and also they were talking about the need really to have PBOT like engage in this work to help block off some of this. So there's not necessarily, you know, the, the repeat once the, once the cleanup is done. And to me, that's like an, uh, an incredible example of like where we need to have better coordination between, um, not just offices, but jurisdictions. So my question around the street services um, coordination center is really, you know, 
the around the authority that they would have, you know, like, as these people are sitting around the table as the different jurisdiction. Um, uh, uh, departments at the city are um, sitting around the table, like the authority that they're going to have to actually enact and engage in some of the um, issues that are being raised and then how they're going to be engaging. In coordinating potentially outside of the city of Portland. So, 1 of the, you know, I talked about Metro, but I also have a lot of concerns about ODOT and the, and the impact that um, we're seeing on ODOT properties and their role into this. So, I don't know if you have any insight on that, but that's something that. If you do, like, in the conversation you have, I'd love to hear it, but I also think it's something that I'll post to the city as well. You raise really good questions, Commissioner, and I, I think um, there is a lot of planning work still to do in terms of really understanding who is at that table and how the authority flows from that from that table. Um, so I think it is a good question to, to talk to your city colleagues about. Um, I think recognizing the importance of working across other jurisdictions, including including Metro and ODOT, both of those jurisdictions are on our Friday morning calls for that very reason, right? There's clearly a need for, for coordination and collaboration. So I would be very surprised if there weren't a mechanism built into this center to, to ensure that that kind of collaboration is happening. Um, I believe there is a specific investment on the city side in some resources to facilitate cross jurisdiction, Metro and, and others garbage cleanup and some of the challenges administratively that have existed to, to try to coordinate that work. So um, I, I'll be very surprised if, if that isn't addressed in, in the constitution of the center. But again, there's a lot of work, I think, still to do to, to fully develop the vision of that. Yeah, well, I appreciate the, the investment and I think it's probably a need that's happened for a long time and using the dollars that we have to really kickstart that is important. And that's really how I um, look at all of the investments that we're making, especially with this package is, is we are recognizing that there has been long term work in planning and making investments. I mean, we know we've seen, you know, the, the voters in Portland pass a housing bond, the metro, you know, area voters vote for a housing bond as well as the support of housing services measure rate. Right? And there's um, a recognition that this is a long term issue that we need long term investment on. And yet we have this unique opportunity with this BIT surplus dollars that we have at both the city and the county um, to, to respond and to um, do the work that we can to fill the gaps to make the system that we are having in place and the planning that we are doing as robust and responsive as possible. And that's one of the, you know, and that's really, um, as I look at the type of investments that we're making, um, really, um, you know, makes me the most hopeful about the work that we're doing and the coordination. And I just really appreciate um, uh, chair the the outreach that you did to the city to actually kickstart this process because I think it was definitely needed. I also appreciate the way that the investments, especially as we're looking at the outreach and navigation, um, the hygiene and storage and where those um, responses are going, and as we're looking at um, the shelter capacity and expanding that and really being strategic in the areas of the city and the county where we need these kinds of investments the most based on what we're seeing. Um, today and what we're hearing from community members, what we're hearing from constituents, what we're hearing from organizations and businesses about where people are feeling the most pain points and really need um, both the city and the county to step in in these ways to help um, facilitate delivery of service and response and coordination. And I think that's um, and that's where I'm seeing the investments that we're making here um, happen. And I do think, you know, in looking at filling the gaps, I mean, I would point to the hygiene and storage. Um, strategic implementation investments that we're making about $5 million is really, you know, looking at that gap that we knew existed in people being able to be successful into shelter or having shelter be a um, realistic option for people, you know, in, in just in driving um, my kids to school this morning and then coming into work, I was looking at some of the, um, the folks who are, who are living outside in, in areas. And there are like structures that have been there for months and that are like semi-permanent structures, right? Getting people um, to a place where they feel comfortable moving to a different location, to a different home is going to take more than just asking them to move, right? It's the concern that people have about their property, about their pets, about um, you know where they're gonna be able to go. And I think that this investment that we're making very specifically is helping that transition. And the fact that as we're talking about expanding shelter capacity, we are looking at um, uh, the mixed, you know, like the mixed delivery, uh, using that from the preschool for all phrase, but really the mixed shelter um, that we're seeing. Hotels we know are some of the fastest and more cost efficient ways of actually getting people safely off the street. But we're also looking at um, programs like 
shelter now and others that are doing more alternative means um, to create that mix of, so that people can be most successful in being able to receive services and being able to um, get on the path to that permanent housing that you that you were talking about in your um, original comments, Mark. So I appreciate all of that. Um, you know, I also am going to be interested to see um, as we are making these investments today, how this moves into our um, FY23 budget um, and where that makes sense. But I also know that, you know, looking forward in terms of our um, revenue forecast and what we're looking at, and then we're going to be getting that in a couple of weeks, but we know that we're going to have supportive housing services dollars that will be coming and that revenue will be increasing year over year um, as well as other means. And so, you know, when we're looking at how this fits into the, the long term plans, you know, again, I believe that these are investments that we've needed to make that we're response we're responding to and um, especially as we're looking at where the type of congregate motel and other um, property that we're getting that they will be able to turn into long term investments and long term um, capacity expansion that we know we're going to need long term. So um, I'm really happy about that, but we'll also be you know, paying attention as we get into our budget cycle about how all these are going. Um, and as we're having those discussions, as I'm thinking ahead of gearing into those budget discussions, you know, we need to be checking in on the progress of the work that's been done on the investments that we're making today and having a check in, um, you know, in February, like a 90 day time frame makes a lot of sense to me in terms of um, making sure that um, things are going in the direction we want. Things are on tasks. Like that's that's what I'm going to be looking for in terms of um, are these investments that we want to continue and and how are they um, going? And of course, um, checking in with the community members in terms of how they're feeling about these. So um, overall, I'm um, really happy with um, these type of investments. Um, the workforce retention, I think, is a huge thing. I know it's been said already, but you know we're seeing this across the board from tech support to restaurant workers to um, every every area you can imagine, including, as we know, um, the people who are working in our homelessness response system. So I really appreciate that investment as well. So um, thank you. I'm very happy to support these today. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I really want to appreciate the hard work that uh, I'm sure that I have not seen uh, behind the scenes, and I know that uh, it is challenging at times to work with other jurisdictions. And the fact that we have this partnership with the city of Portland uh, is really important and needed. And uh, I'm sure that there was a lot of um, negotiations and compromise involved that none of us uh, had the opportunity to see. So I just want to appreciate um, that partnership. And I want to thank Mark uh, and your team for addressing the housing crisis with the urgency that people have been screaming and yelling at us to do. And so I think I, I appreciate what my fellow commissioners have said. I, I, I worry that we um, will be you know, paralyzed about analyzing things to death. The reality is, is that 31 million dollars may sound like a lot of money. It's not, and it's not going to solve homelessness. But if we can bring on 400 beds, bring behavioral health, and do all the things that we know works, then I'm happy. It's not, it's not the panacea that everybody is going to, um, you know, wish for, but it gets us one step closer. And the other thing I wanted to call out that this money is called the BIT the business income tax that comes from businesses. So I think we need to recognize uh, that while jurisdictions are our partners, uh, so is the business community. So I do want to thank the business community uh, because they're the ones who are paying uh, for this incredible investment. We didn't get here overnight. Um, I was just looking, Damage State Hospital closed in 1995, 26 years ago. So I am very doubtful that we are going to solve this problem uh, immediately. But the investments that we are making today are, are absolutely critical. And what it comes down to is that do we trust the people that we've hired to lead our organization in the right direction? And I do. I have to count on your expertise, Mark, 
Julie Dodge, Serena, all of you, because I don't have that expertise. And frankly, if I can't trust you, then you probably shouldn't be in the position that you are in. So I don't have a lot to say other than, than it's about trust, partnership, and collaboration. And if you talk to any business owner in downtown Portland or Old Town, I think they're going to be pretty thrilled about the investments that we're making. So I want to thank the chair's office and all of you who have worked. I know probably nonstop. A government does not move fast. And I, frankly, I've never seen y'all move so fast. So I am absolutely thrilled with this package. Is it enough? No, but I can't think of a better way to spend $31 million. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to add my thanks to staff um, from all across the county, as well as our city partners who helped us build this package. For nearly two years, we have endured multiple and overlapping crises, both as a community and as an organization. So when we found ourselves with this rare opportunity to make an immediate impact on the lives of the people that we serve, we knew what to do. We have heard extensively from the community through thousands of emails and hundreds of meetings and forums. We also have an incredible county staff who instantly knew where the gaps in our system lay because they are the ones in the trenches walking alongside those who are experiencing these crises every day. And because of this work, it is worth noting that we are not starting from scratch, but rather building on the tremendous work that has come before. These investments are intentional, coordinated, and strategic. Thank you. And Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? No. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The bud mod is approved. Um, is the next item R2B? R2B. R2B. Budget modification HD 03822. Appropriation of 2.9 million of one time only business income tax general fund for BH and PH. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R2B. I feel like we're back in the Star Wars lingo almost. Good uh, morning. Thank you, Chair. Tasha, if we can resume our presentation, um, we I have with me Julie Dodge and Jessica Guernsey from Behavioral Health and Public Health to review the investments uh, in behavioral health and public health. Neither of these investments have changed since you saw them last Tuesday but they'll give you a brief update on implementation and um, what the programs are going to look like. Thank you, Julie. Well, thank you. And for the record, I'm Julie Dodge. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the interim director of behavioral health for Multnomah County. I also want to, before I jump into these two specific things, acknowledge some of the comments that were raised about how does all this coordinate and fit into our system? I want to thank Sheriff, uh, Commissioner Myron for the acknowledgement of the role of the local mental health authority. And that's one of the things that we are working diligently to try and, and coordinate across this whole thing. One of the things that I have been plotting is a better, clearer definition of our crisis services system from mobile teams that are maybe not so crisis-y to the crisis response and how are we all communicating. So I just want to bring that assurance that we are working on mapping that better and building out those relationships better. Um, because we don't want to have confusion. We want easy access for all of these things. These two particular investments um, may seem kind of random if you don't know the history, but they are intentional and they are not new to us. The first one, uh, the behavioral health inreach team first came on our radar, radar last spring when a group of providers came to us and said, we, we need help to be able to support the folks that we are serving on a daily basis, three times a day, four meals, where we have high volumes of people coming together and their, their needs have increased. They don't necessarily do well in those collective spaces together and they were asking for, for support and unfortunately we didn't have the resource at that time. This particular investment builds allows us to be able to do that to respond to a need that the community has brought forward to say, will you please help us? And, and we're building on what we have already learned can be effective. That we're building on, it says the shelter in reach, but really to have a stable presence throughout the meal services and at several other locations where people gather at a specific time 
where we can build relationships with the same people. That is not so much. It's not crisis response. It is crisis prevention. It is helping people to maintain in these spaces that can be uncomfortable to build relationships so that we can also help them access other supports and services as part of that continuum. And then if someone does escalate to be able to, to quickly be able to bring in crisis and to be able to stay with a person to support them and stabilize them and keep them safe until other supports can arrive. So our, our goal is to really create safer spaces in the moment where people are gathering as they're striving simply to get their basic needs met of food and clothing. Um, we are also working with the community groups to be able to say, all right, who's best at doing this and who can most efficiently get people hired and present. We want to honor the existing partnerships that, that are there in the community as well as bring in folks who have the expertise in doing this kind of work. And we're navigating that as we go. Um, our intent is to be able to build on what we know, build on those partnerships, and hopefully we have we do have the capacity to, to do some contract amendments quickly. So that should be good news for us. It, uh, I, so that first team, location specific, um, and at this point serving three locations at, at designated times, and it will be the same people day in, day out. Um, the second team is the Behavioral Health Motel Wraparound Services, and this is really to build on what we've learned from placing people with severe and persistent mental illness in motels because there hasn't been other places for them to be. And one of the things that helps them to be st stable is having what we call a motel wraparound team that consists of a peer and a professional who can help, you know, one, be check in with folks on a daily basis, help them access their supports from medications and services to, you know, just making sure they're okay today. Um, this will allow us to, you know, potentially place people in one location together as opposed to intermixed with the general public and have a greater presence and support. What we found is that the folks who are who connect with our teams are more likely to be stable. We're about at this point and, and noting that this is fairly new, about 25% of them are being able to con be connected into permanent housing. We think it will get bigger and better, or that that number will increase. But one of the things that we've also been trying to do with all of these investments is to build in quality assessment that says, does it really work? Because we don't want to do just random things that don't work. And so we do want to be able to assess where are people going? How is it helping? Is it key? Are they... Are we preventing them from homelessness? Are we preventing them from having to access emergency rooms or at least reducing that number? Because for some people, that is just part of their reality. And how are we helping them connect with long-term stabilization? So all of those things will be built into our process and uh, we will continue to refine and define as we move this forward. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman, do you, oh, first of all, do we have uh, public comment on this section? No, Madam Chair, we do not. Thank you. Mr. Stegman, questions, comments? Uh, just a comment, Julie. Thank you so much for being so thoughtful about what you're presenting to us today. And uh, I really appreciate the support uh, for the motel shelter program. I, I know some families that, that live in motels and they do talk about, about the lack of behavioral health resources. So appreciate what you've brought forward and thank you for all of your hard work as well as your entire teams. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, no, thank you, Julie, for the work of you and your team and, and putting these proposals together and really figuring out how, what's the best use of this um, unlooked for dollars to, to fill in the gaps and to really um, uh, add to the system in ways that are needed. I, I was thinking about how what we learned over the years around like family shelter and the best way to deliver that. And I feel like these investments that we're making today are very similar and that we're learning from how we're currently doing things in terms of what are the additional supports that we need to make people be successful and get them the help that they need. Um, so just um, appreciate this and looking um, forward to um, having these teams um, really add that um, additional support, outreach and connection that, that are needed in our community right now. Thanks, Chair. Yep. Thank you, Julie. Um, really appreciate the work that went into creating these proposals. You know, the first one in particular um, feels very focused and very responsive to what community has been asking for. And I think that it is one of the pieces that 
um, folks will see having an immediate impact on specific service providers and the atmosphere that they are contending with right now. So very appreciative of that. I do have a question about the behavioral health motel wraparound teams, which makes complete sense, but in terms of connecting it to, again, the overall objective of responding to immediate need on, on the streets. Um, what I hear a lot, and you know, I'll, I'll use folks and businesses and service providers in Old Town as an example, but but they are by no means the only ones who raise this, is more of that um, acute mental health distress situation that creates safety risk both for the person experiencing it and for the people around. So, can you talk a little bit more about whether the, the you know, what, how how do these pieces support that need and? Perhaps it is that the behavioral health motel wraparound teams connect with acute situations on the street, help people into motels or, or not. I'm not sure. So, they, so our motel wraparound teams really serve the people who move into these spaces and in our range through the choice program, it's some people are only there for a couple of days, but more likely they're there for 30 to 60 days. We've actually housed someone for as long as 300 days in a hotel and having that 1, having a place to be helps prevent from being out unsheltered in the street and then having folks help stabilize them in that space so they can hopefully move into the next space. That's that's really their function. This is not an outreach team. This is focused on the people who are staying in these motel complexes. And uh, the, the idea is that we would have a concentration of folks housed in a single motel that then we're there every day. And we are there every day checking in on them, knocking on their doors, seeing how their days are going, help making sure that they're able to access support services, appointments that they need to get to, and also then help make those connections to longer term housing. So this is about preventing the escalation, working with the folks who have found their way in. And, and just by way of example, I mean, right now, about half of the people leaving psychiatric emergency acute care are going to houselessness. So if we can put them in a hotel and provide them with a wraparound support, that's going to be, it's not perfect, but it's way better than going outside. And as we continue to work, I think you, you all have heard some of the investments that are coming specifically around behavioral health housing in the future. This is part of that continuum that can build into longer term supports. Thank you. That that helps it, you know, it helps me see it as a prevention rather than as a, a prevention of those acute uh, situations that people are, are so concerned about right now. And that makes complete sense. I do still still feel like there's a gap in terms of that immediate need of of, you know, responding to acute situations on the streets. I've asked about project respond and I understand there are things to be worked out, but it seems as if whatever, whatever the issues are with that model right now, that seems to be the one team or response that we have that goes out in situations of acute crisis to, to deal with those. That's not Portland street response. It seems to be project response. So I guess I just say that as, as registering my interest in um, continuing to understand and to work on how we respond to that particular kind of immediate need. And we anticipate through our state agreement to have increased funding for project respond in a very short time. And we're also facilitating conversations between specifically Portland Street response and project respond to uh, better collaborate as well as behavioral health unit uh, BHU. So, I mean, those things are happening is just not in this specific proposal. That's helpful to know that there's specific funding that's going to be coming to to ramping up that sort of a response. So yes. thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Mr. Myron. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. I really appreciate um, in particular your collaboration, your systems thinking, your partnership um, in leading the behavioral health division and uh, and this uh, proposal uh, will be sort of two proposals that are in the uh in our in uh our to be to today um i in terms of we we've talked about this i think it's um really important uh in terms of that coordination and how we can be most effective at that 
there is a lot of um, conversation work underway in that regard. Two years ago, there was a sequential intercept mapping process that was done um, uh, that I'd sponsored with LIPSIC through um, when we were talking about Portland Street response. And it's where you've got all the outreach providers all over um, from whatever jurisdiction they're in the same room and they explain what they do and where they fit into this continuum. And the goal ultimately was to make recommendations how to make that more effective and collaborative and coordinated. And um, it uh, has regained some steam. I've talked a lot with Commissioner Hardesty about that, and we are going to be working on that kind of coordination city level and with, with your office, because it is part of our role as the um, local mental health authority to do that kind of coordination and ensure it's done right so that when we, we don't innovate on top of already sort of full, but not as effective as possible um, uh, infrastructure that's already there. And also I appreciate, appreciate your mentioning sort of the continuum and Commissioner Jayapal's questions about that because these all seem like um, great opportunities to connect with the behavioral behavioral health resource center, which will be such an important um, resource where people can go to uh, have respite, to have services, to avoid falling into crisis. And then also the behavioral health emergency coordination network or beacon, which is this incredibly collaborative um, partnership with community um, around people who do get to the level of crisis so that they have a place to go that is not ER or the jail. And that's another thing that falls within the role of the local mental health authority, the statutory obligation to administer behavioral health crisis services. And I so appreciate that you, um, Ebony Clark, Abby and Erica have really leaned into that um, work and that the county is taking a leadership role in that. Uh, hopefully we will get a board briefing soon on it because it is one of the big missing links in our system that can make a difference and ties directly into these um, types of services. Um, I like, uh, I really appreciate how Commissioner Jayapal described the, um, you know, the community based uh, team as it's, it's focused and it is responsive to what community has asked for. It's also innovative. Um, I, I do have a question. Are we anticipating that peers will be involved in that team and be out there? Yeah, so, so the folks who originally put this together have actually already on their own scraping their own resources brought in 1 peer and what our hope is to be able to expand that for them. And that those peers will partner with the professional quote team, whatever. Yeah, I yes. want to call it. Everybody's professionals doing the best they can with what they got. Right. But to build an integrated team that builds on their success includes peers and also people who can help access the broader continuum very quickly. That's great. And um, when I, I met with Scott Kerman of Blend Shea House and learned about sort of his concept for sort of this increased behavioral health and de-escalation support. And uh, I was convinced then, and I'm even more convinced now, this is a really important investment and can serve as a demonstration project to deploy so it can intervene, um, again, as Commissioner Dreipel mentioned, with other uh, folks who are living outdoors um, because that is a huge need. And that shelter and the wraparound services are critically important for people with behavioral health, uh, serious mental health, behavioral health conditions. So um, I am very heartened to see this investment as well. I have one, one Additional question. I know the allocation is um, proposed to be 2.5 million dollars. And what what is the duration of that? I know I have probably received that somewhere in my. Notes. As I understand, the bit taxes current or the bit surplus runs through June 30th, and then as we are planning for the future years, we'll have to consider out what is possible, what is feasible, how does it fit into our existing crisis system, and response system. So, we so. Hopeful and to be determined. Great. Thank you. I don't have any. Jessica Guernsey. 
Good afternoon, uh, Jessica Guernsey, Public Health Director, Multnomah County. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Not, do we want to put the slides back up? Okay, great. Well, it's lovely to see you all, Chair Flory and um, Commissioners. I, it's been a really long time, <laughs> so it's nice to see you all. Um, I think um, for the amount of time that I've spent in front of you all virtually today is going to be a modicum of time, I guess, compared to my esteemed colleagues. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our vector control investment um, as part of the bid proposal. Um, as Christian mentioned, um, nothing has changed since um, we talked about this uh, last Thursday. Um, so I'll just go over the investments and then answer any questions. But before I do that, I just really want to I want to appreciate Commissioner Stegman, your um, remark about um, listening to our technical experts and leaders. And in this case, um, as you all know, we have a fantastic group um, led by Andrea Hamburg and Environmental Health Services. And this um, collection of proposals is really based on our role in public health um, with uh, the particular issues around um, vector control. Um, so, as I mentioned, nothing has changed. So, what's up on the screen? Um, the first investment um, for uh, 258,000 um, builds off of our current staffing, which is quite lean. Um, we would hire two new uh, vector specialists to increase capacity for rodent inspections and surveillance in the downtown and urban core. And then the second investment for 147,000 um, works in tandem with many of the things you've heard about this morning in relation uh, to the houseless and homeless population specific um, to uh, situations that can contribute uh, to vectors, particularly around rats. So this, po this position will provide subject matter expertise um, to community partners to improve environmental conditions um, and unsanctioned encamp encampments, outdoor shelters, and other shelter programs. Um, this will include site inspections and a shelter operator toolkit around vector-borne diseases and methods for control. Um, so this, again, just builds off of our current work um, and expands it out to address um, the immediate needs that we're hearing, obviously, quite frequently from um, public business owners and others. Great, thanks. And quick questions as we are quickly running out of time here. So quick questions or comments, Commissioner Stegman? No questions. Thank you for all the work. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I had one question. Um, I appreciate the notes we got on this program. So it looks like there's going to be a monitoring investigation for homeowners and community gardens, restaurants. Is there anything for other commercial or, or businesses that are being planned for this? Do you think that will be part of the work for the? Um, I think part of what we're going to be doing is um, iterating. I mean, we're going to be learning as we get in there to really understand what's going on and building upon it. So as Julie was, you know, talking about with the behavioral health um, response uh, work, we're going to be looking at, you know, what is needed and building off of that in the budget. As I said. Honestly, the vector control team has been fairly lean the last couple of years, and there's been a lot of change. So we're going to really need to look at that and build on it. Yeah, and I am um, yes, I always I'm always amazed at what environmental health is able to do considering the size of that town. So appreciate yep. that. Thank you. Sure, Jaipal. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Jessica. It's good to see you in person. Um, no additional questions. I appreciated your responses to some of the questions from the briefing. You know, and I know. Uh, again, this strikes me as a very concrete response to a very concrete ask um, and that it will deliver some immediate results to, to the conditions that folks are experiencing. So thank you for putting it together. Mr. Myron. Thank you. It's so nice to see you here, Jessica, um, in a role other than talking about same role, but um, talking about something other than COVID and um, it, it is important to call out that, um, you know, I believe that unsheltered homelessness is a public health crisis and it was so long before COVID has escalated with COVID. And so I think that we need to keep that in the forefront of our mind as the local public health authority that, you know, the camping trash hygiene rats, et cetera. We talk about the garbage the garbage is where our is what leads to some of the rats, some of the health issues, et cetera, we are inextricably linked in this. And this, I think, falls within our direct scope of authority as public health. So I think I would like to talk about that more. In terms of vector control, it's obviously extremely important. Um, I've seen lots of rats, I have pet rats, but um, I've seen lots of not pet rats uh, going to encampments and um, and I, I, do worry we're not getting to the cause and 
we'll see any decrease or remediation in the number of rats. So just want to set expectations there. But I think this is a really important process and role that um, will continue to, to grow and that we hopefully can address us that as we address trash, et cetera. Um, I also uh, expressed an interest during last week's briefing about a position assessing the environmental impact of the waste associated with urban camping and not just how many tons there are, but the environmental impact and how we can remediate. So I'm hopeful that maybe this position can work on that. It's really uh, important. And um, as a public health opportunity, I think it's important to, I think we should um, broaden our approach to domicile unknown and not just report on number of deaths, which will be probably tremendously escalating with COVID, but think about this in the terms of how we treat gun violence as a public health Right, so these, these are health issues. People are dying in escalating, increasing numbers, and hopefully we will um, be able to address that. So those are all my comments, but I really appreciate your work, and I, I totally support this position, all of these positions. All right, Asia, a roll call vote on the entirety of R2B. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kavori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Um, Teja, would you please do R5 next? R5, budget modification number non D 004 22, appropriating $400,000 for the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council's Transforming Justice Initiative. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Segment seconds approval of R5. Abby Stamp, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, it's lovely to see you in person. For the record, Abby Stamp, Executive Director of the Multnomah County Local Public Safety Coordinating Council. And this request for $400, sorry, this mask makes it really hard to get up and run over. $400,000. For $400,000, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hasn't changed since we met last week. I do have a bit of an update and just a summary to share with you all this morning. So transforming justice, our effort to create a fully implementable vision for the future of justice policy was actually born from our participation with the executive session on the future of justice policy at Columbia University Square One project. A major theme that resulted from those sessions is reckoning. And the criminal legal system People who have harmed others should reckon with the pain they have caused. As leaders of the criminal legal system, we too must reckon with, with the harm we have caused to defendants, to victims, and particularly black, indigenous, and people of color. A reckoning process is more than an acknowledgement of harm. It's also about creating and committing to permanent change. Transforming justice is our real first attempt to reckon for the centuries old oppressive criminal legal practices and the inadequately resourced housing and health interventions for people in acute need. While the original budget allowed for focus groups in this project and for interviews and for surveys, the core working group, and at this work since January, made a recommendation to our larger steering committee to increase these engagements and do more with those stakeholders who are directly impacted by legal housing and health systems. So this budget modification seeks to allocate $400,000 to increase the number of people we will be able to hear from and impact our vision. In addition, these funds will speed up our engagement process, allowing for emerging themes to inform our fiscal year 23 budget development. So to make sure we are able to complete the scope of work with urgency and diligence, these funds will escalate discovery and analysis, both of which will speed up the visioning and our implementation timelines. And as I shared, the proposed scope of work has grown in important and empowering ways. And I suppose that makes a lot of sense now that we're knee deep in this project because the systems we want to impact are centuries old, struggle significantly with inertia, and continue to learn how to lift up community voice. Well, those of us here today did not create these inadequate and oppressive systems, I believe it is our responsibility to fix them. Thank you. Thank you. 
Tasia, any public comment on this agenda? No, Madam Chair. Okay, questions or comments, Commissioner Myron? Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you for taking the time also to talk more about this with me um, and uh, and work through some of the questions I had. Uh, I absolutely support the Transforming Justice Initiative. And, you know, I think we all feel that tension between wanting to take immediate action to end the violence in our communities now, while recognizing that unless we address the root causes and particularly the way our dysfunctional criminal legal system actually perpetuates and contributes to community violence, we will not be able to reverse deeply concerning trends. So we need to act with urgency, but also with community input and buy-in, particularly from those most impacted by our systems. Also with innovation and with a transformative vision, which is what this process will be um, providing. So I want to um, particularly express deep gratitude to um, Babak Zolfagari, who gave his time yesterday. We talked in depth and he pushed me over the, he, he convinced me of the import of this investment at this moment in time. It absolutely makes sense. And um, just, uh, yeah, appreciate the work he's doing. Um, one of the, one of the things we talked about just in terms of his work raised a question for me and in those the sort of the focus groups and uh, interacting with people who are impacted do we have groups um, or anticipate groups that uh, are comprised of youth uh, Commissioner Myron, at this point, we don't because this is um, very focused on the adult criminal legal system. However, I do continue work with the juvenile services division and Mary Geelan in their transforming probation project, which is very much amplifying and including the voice of community families and youth um, through their work as well. But there are ample times and spaces to continue to iterate this work to make sure that the right voices are brought to the table and considered. That's great. And I think we, we should involve youth everywhere and anywhere because the teenagers right now are our old adults who will be in our system. And if we want to intervene and change our adult system, we need to talk to the youth to see what they need that could put them on a different trajectory. So I would just encourage with this investment and focus groups, at least one um, be dedicated to the youth who are engaged in, um, you know, whether it's in gang related violence or other um, otherwise um, involved in the community. So strongly encourage that, but uh, that's it. Um, I will su absolutely support this. Chair Jaya Paul. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Abby. Um, you know, thank you for the conversation we had last week after the briefing in which you provided me some additional context and answered some questions. Thank you also for your opening comments today. Um, I really appreciated the connection that you made between the work that we're doing in the criminal legal system and houselessness. And I think that helps to pull this together into the whole package that we are looking at today, because it is a different, it's a different piece of the package. Um, it is a planning piece and planning doesn't always sound urgent, but it's also a very different kind of planning process. And I think that, I think your opening comments um, uh, highlight in the conversation that we had highlighted that. Uh, and I, at those opening comments also, you know, urgency, immediacy, those, those are different things. And sometimes they're the same as well. And there is an ur urgency to the reform of the criminal legal system that might not feel the same short term immediate, but it's still urgent. So with all of that, and given the fact that in the scheme of the package at large, this is one of the smaller investments as well. Um, you know, I am, I'm very happy to, to support it. Thank you. Trevega Peterson. Thank you, Terry. Thanks so much, Abby, um, for this and for your time today and talking through this. One of the things that makes me most excited about this investment is that it enables us to really gain a year in, in putting then into place, um, like budget allocations, more programs based on the work that this $400,000 is going to facilitate with the, with the conversations and with the interviews. Um, the focus groups, all of that. And, um, you know, I don't think we can wait a day to, um, to do this work of, um, of 
transforming justice and being able to to have something ready to go for the FY23 budget cycle is very exciting. So thank you. Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Abby, thank you so much for all of your incredible work and your your small but mighty team. Uh, transforming our justice system, I think, is uh, should be one of our highest priorities, and it's deeply intertwined in our houselessness crisis as well, and many of our social ills. So I support you, I support this program, and I really want to appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And Tasia, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Byron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kapori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. And now we can go back to R3. Thank you. R3, budget modification number JOHS 006 22, appropriating $500,000 for the emergency shelter. RFPQ program in the Joint Office of Homeless Services for mid year emergency investments. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R3. Welcome back, Mark Jolin. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, again, for the record, my name is Mark Jolin. I see him as pronouns, and I'm the director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services for Multnomah County and the city of Portland. Um, this is a very exciting uh, uh, opportunity. These additional funds um, that are proposed to go to support our alternative shelter, RFPQ, um, really will be an opportunity to expand further the number of partners that are involved in this exciting effort to expand alternative shelter options in our community. As you know, we ran an RFPQ process um, in the spring and had a significant number of new organizations apply to offer these kinds of shelter services. A lot of emerging organizations that have not necessarily done shelter this way before, some that are very active in other parts of our system, but are open to becoming shelter providers. Um, as you can see here, we're in active negotiations with a number of those providers. Um, some of them are looking at alternative shelters. Some of them are working with us uh, specifically on safe rest village expansion. We did set aside, as you know, $3 million in this year's budget. Um, to allow us to move forward with projects. Um, but we also know that uh, there are more good ideas in the community, more organizations qualified looking to contribute to this effort than we have budget authority to work with right now. So this additional $500,000 very concretely um, will allow us to reach out to additional partners and initiate um, this fiscal year uh, the uh, potentially additional alt shelter opportunities. So I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Tasia, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. Thank you. Mr. Stegman. Thank you again, Mark. I appreciate uh, you know the alternative shelter conversation we've been having for a long time and to see you continue to actualize that. I really appreciate that. We know that so many people have different needs and different requirements. And I think that you and your uh, department have done a really good job of trying to assess what people's needs are. So appreciate your work. Thank you, Peterson. Thank you, Mark. I just appreciate this additional $500,000 on top of the $3 million that we've already invested in alternative shelters. And um, it, one of the things that it, like really strikes me is in all the conversations I've had with different groups who are so interested in doing this work and really trying things out, this gives us an opportunity to expand that capacity. So um, I'm glad that we're able to expand the um, FRPQ and get um, more folks in there as well as um, thanks for the update on the work that's already happening on that. Mr. Jayapal. Thanks again, Mark. I'm realizing that I actually addressed this, I think, in my comments earlier, um, which is the, uh, sort of pointing out that it is so important to respond when community wants to participate with us in doing this work. So that's the most important piece of this to me is that it is community led um, and it supports community organizations in doing this work. So thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Mark, um, for engaging with my office about this investment uh, and and just over years. So really, really appreciate it. Also, thanks to Adam where was this, uh, for for his support as well. And I too have been impressed and encouraged by the community members uh, and organizations who have stepped up to be part of our emergency response during our multiple crises, including um, stepping up to create more and innovative types of alternative shelter. I know some just need that extra help to get off the ground and running and um, 
I support anything we can do to facilitate that innovation and creativity and responsiveness. I want to particularly call out We Shine PDX, which is an organization looking to develop micro villages and particularly important, um, a model that can be replicated and can be distributed across a wide geographic region. This is aligned with the framework model I proposed in our fiscal year 22 budget, um, which acknowledged that we need an array of options. There cannot be a one size fits all solution. Um, and it's why I advocated to increase our investment in the joint offices RFPQ. So this will help fund those innovative programs that can potentially make a difference, not only in increasing capacity, but actually how we think about and implement uh, shelter. So thank you. Thank you. Sure. Please take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jadlo. Aye. Commissioner Baker Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The budget modification is adopted. R4, budget modification number MCSO 002 22, BIT emergency investment gun violence reduction. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Segment seconds. Approval of R4. Welcome, Under Sheriff Morrissey O'Donnell. Good afternoon, everyone. Chair and Commissioners, for the record, I'm Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell and I'm the Under Sheriff for Multnomah County. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today regarding important investments to address the impacts of gun violence in our community. I know that all of you join me in a commitment to improving the response to violence in our neighborhoods, and we are invested in partnering with advocates, community par county departments, and local public safety organizations to develop long term strategies. We also recognize that we have to act with urgency to promote safety and build trust with members of our community. The Sheriff's Office proposes 321,000 in additional funding for three law enforcement professionals to work on firearm investigations and to assist with protection orders. Specifically, two law enforcement deputy sheriffs to assist with the timely service of protection orders and dispossession of firearms and ammunition when ordered by the court and one detective to focus on gun violence investigations as part of the Federal Bureau of Investigations Safe Streets Initiative. I am proud of the collaborative work of MCSO to keep our communities safe, and these important law enforcement positions work to remove firearms from those who pose the most risk of community, vi community violence. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office respectfully requests the approval of budget modification MCSO 00222 in the amount of 321,000 dedicating additional resources to address gun violence. Thank you very much for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yo, Tasha, did we receive any public com comment? No, Madam Chair, we did not. Mr. Stegman, questions or comments? No questions. Thank you, Under Sheriff. Appreciate uh, all of the work uh, that you and MCSO continues to do and I know that you are very shorthanded and am pleased to support this amendment. Sure. Take it, Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, under Sheriff, just one question. What is the timeline for bringing these, um, the deputies and detective online? So the detective is currently online. He is working uh, collaboratively with our local partners already and uh, investigating all gun violence incidents in East County. And then we are working on uh, recruiting and retention efforts to ensure that we're able to uh, very soon provide the additional staff in the civil unit. Okay, then just a follow up question. So for the, the detective that's already on stand, um, is, are these dollars just supplanting like the salary that they're already being paid or is there going to be a, another detective position that will be backfilled with these dollars? We would backfill the position for the general detective position. Uh, we reallocated that work to a detective to focus solely on gun violence. Initially, that was not part of the budget process. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Under Sheriff. Um, Appreciated the answers that your office provided mine uh, since the briefing. And I think these are really uh, targeted and necessary investments. The gun dispossession piece, I think, is incredibly important to stemming the tide of violence that we're seeing on the streets. And service of family protective orders is something that I've been concerned about for a while and appreciated 
the clarification that with this additional staffing, we can expect to see, you know, going from somewhere around 60% of orders served to 80% of orders served. And that I think will have a significant immediate impact as well. So thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, um, Nicole, and I uh, wholeheartedly support our support our innovative public health approaches to violence prevention. But it is very clear that law enforcement investigation and intervention is part of the continuum of responses required to stem the unprecedented violence impacting our communities right now. Um, timely service of the protective orders and firearms dispossession are truly life saving interventions to protect our community and uh, particularly survivors of domestic violence. So thank you for your work here and um, I support this. Thank you. And as this is the last agenda item that we have on our dock today, Christian, correct me if I'm wrong. We have one more slide, but it's not a voting item. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. I just want to say thank you um, under sheriff and thank you to your team. I also just want to go back and, and pause for a moment that we have um, really, this has been quite an amazing day. And um, when we first learned about these unprecedented dollars, I will steal a phrase from my colleague to my right. Um, I immediately reached out to the city of Portland, realizing that they were in the same position that we were and worked very closely with the mayor and with Commissioner Ryan to put together a thoughtful and yet urgent partnership on how to distribute these dollars to our community who we know we've heard from thousands and thousands of residents that they needed our help. So um, I, I wanna give a special thank you to the folks at the city. I also wanna thank um, my chief of staff, Kim Milton. It has been hours and hours and hours of work on top of all the other things that are going on. Um, crisis upon crisis, as we always say. Um, so. I, we will, in these next few months, have some real intentional discussions about the ongoing piece. I think a couple of folks have highlighted that, um, you know, these these are not um, necessarily new problems, nor are, nor are they problems that are going to be over very quickly. Uh, so we know that there's some ongoing um, dollars that will be needed. We will be entering our budget process, or already have started our budget process for FY23. So we will be intentional about those conversations. And then we will have a follow up, as I said in my opening comments at 3 months and at 6 months, we will come back and have briefings on how these programs are going and see if any uh, modifications or adjustments needed need to be made. And then lastly, I just want to say that I really firmly believe that these dollars are going to make a real difference. And I, I'm so appreciative of all the work that has gone on um, by my staff, by all the county staff who realize the urgency and the need to um, to find where there are gaps, find where there are programs that are working really well that we need to add on to, um, and to highlight the need across the system, whether we're talking about people who are living on our streets, whether we're talking about people who should not have access to guns, and whether we're talking about reinventing our, um, our criminal justice system. So I wanna thank everyone for the immense and amazing work that you've done. And I, sh I, I look out and see Serena, and I wanna say our CEO, um, not only are we helping our community, but we're recognizing our employees who showed up day after day after day through crisis after crisis after crisis, committing themselves over and over again to the work that they do to make sure that everyone in our community um, gets what they need. So um, with that, I know that's not exactly 100% related to, to this budget item, but I had to I had to, to, to say those last few words. Tasia, would you please take a roll call vote? Oh yeah, last slide. No, I don't want to do the last. Just kidding. Last slide. The last slide is just some quick math. The last time we were here, we had a balance of about 1.1 million dollars. We made two new investments today: the $600,000 to expand the community capital program, and then the $500,000 in the alternative shelter program expansion. That leaves us with a balance of $13,464 that we will deposit into the general fund contingency unless anyone has any objections. No, we do not. And now we get a vote. Commissioner Meyer? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. 
All right, I know that commissioner Stigman has to leave. Um, we do have time for any uh, board comments on non agenda items. Um, so I'm going to call on commissioners to see if they have anything to share commissioner. Thank you, Peterson. You are first. Yes, Tara. Thank you so much. Um, great meeting. That was, felt really good. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, and I wanted to remind folks that on Saturday, November 13th, I'm going to be hosting a constituent coffee event at Sebastiano's Sicilian Deli in the Montevillian neighborhood from 9:30 a.m. to 11 a.m. I'm very excited to um, speak in person with my community members over coffee and pastries, and I hope everybody will be able to join. You can RSVP for the event at tinyurl.com slash coffee. So tinyurl.com slash coffee. Thank you. You had me at pastry. Uh, Commissioner Jaipal? I, I can't be pastry. <laughs> I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Byron. On Thursday on Veterans Day, uh, we will not be here, but there is an event. It's called Feed Black Vets. It's from uh, 1 to 4 p.m. And that's at a soul food cart in Northeast Portland called Keys, and it will give free meals to black veterans on Veterans Day. So super exciting and. That is the end of our board meeting today. We will not be meeting on. Um, sorry, Julie, what do you want? You want a picture? Okay. We will not be meeting on Thursday as it is Veterans Day, but we will be back here as we continue our hybrid board meetings on November the 16th at 10 a.m. for a board briefing. So we'll see you all then. Thank you very much.